So thank you, uh, thank you everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Mustafa Aziz Shuman. I welcome you all in our regular virtual webinar session. As you know, today we have a very challenging topics, malignant mesothelioma. Uh, today we have uh, designed our program in a different way. Uh, at first, Dr. F. M. Kamaluddin, Associate Professor, Radiation Oncology. Uh, he will cover the overall management aspect of malignant mesothelioma. Later, there will be a specific discussion regarding the surgical management. And later, later, uh, later part, we will discuss regarding the palliative aspect. We have a special guest from South Africa, Tracy Wood. Uh, she will enlighten us uh, from her 20, 25 years overall experience. Uh, so as usual, we would like to request every participants to participate our poll. So may I request uh, Mr. Samir to please uh, pose the poll for the participants. Mr. Samir. So I'd like to request every participants to participate in the poll. We'll post it here for one minute only. So I mean, next question. Next question, please. Show me next question. So thank you, Shomir. Uh, time is up. So later part of this uh, today's discussion, we'll again uh, post this poll to see the response among our participants. So thank you for participation. And uh, now I would like to request our first presenter, Dr. A.F.M. Kamaluddin, who is the Associate Professor of Radiation Oncology, now working as a uh, ENT Institute, Tezgar Dhaka. Uh, so over to you, Dr. A.F.M. Kamaluddin. So thank you. Uh Shuman, uh, Bismillahirrahman Rahim. Uh, good, good afternoon to everybody. So with the 
uh, the I will say the blessing from my from my teacher, Professor Amir. Hi, sir. I want to start the presentation. I uh, I never realized that this small thing will become such a big pain to make this presentation because this is a small disease, a very uncommon disease, and so we are not very much accustomed with it. And that's why uh, during preparation of the presentation, it was quite a struggling. So I will try to cover just a quick overview. So a 58 years old man with shortness of breath, when the investigation was done, we found there is an extensive pleural thickening. There is an effusion and reduction of the volume of the affected hemithorax. So, I mean, in first stage, everybody will think about a lung cancer with pleural effusion, but we should also, when we see such a thickening of pleura, and then we should never forget the possibility of a diagnosis of mesothelioma. This is the reason why I have given this CT scan. So normally we know that uh, asbestos is the main uh, culprit of causing this disease. And what it happens that asbestos fibers intermingle with the mesothelial cells and this, the macrophage comes into the play and then the immunosuppressive myeloid cells also come and then fibroblast comes and finally the total pathology happens. And uh, a few interesting thing that even we know asbestos is the main culprit, but radiation is also known as a causative factor for mesothelial, uh, pleural mesotheliomia. And surprisingly, smoking is not a risk factor for pleural mesotheliomia, but smoker exposed to asbestos have a higher risk. And among the three types of pathology, epithelioid is a better prognostic com compared to sarcomatoid and mixed type. And the CNS metastasis is quite uncommon in mesothelium. In diagnosis, as there is a pleural effusion, we need to tab it, but sir, unfortunately, pleural fluid are not always diagnostic. Cytology is only 32% positive and 56% suggestive. We need to do a fish test to uh, distinguish between mesothelial cell, uh, reactive mesothelial cell and mesothelial melanoma. And it is again only 79% sensitive. So thoracoscopic guided biopsy is the gold standard and it is 98% diagnostic. And to distinguish between mesothelioma and adenocarcinoma, we need to do some IHC that we'll be covering later. There are some soluble serum mark biomarkers, which also helps in diagnosis. So there are different types of staging, including TNM staging. And one interesting staging is known, I mean, known as sugar baker staging or Birmingham staging system. They have proposed this staging based on on uh, resectability nodal status, and they have validated it with a uh, few number of patients, and they have shown that the higher the stage, worse the outcome. But till now, the International Mesothelium inter Interest Group accept the TNM classification. So regarding management, there is no therapy considered at standard that is quite surprising but it is fact so there are mainly surgery chemotherapy radiotherapy and multimodality treatment surgery is for disease confined to pleural space chemotherapy will come with later radiotherapy provides significant palliation to chest pain wall metastasis in 50 percent of patient but also it plays a good role as adjuvant in multimodality treatment in surgery pleurectomy with decortication or extrapleural pneumonectomy. So this is an interesting paper published in Lancet, which justified the use of surgery that is extrapleural pneumonectomy. And you can see that there is a fair separation of surgery versus no surgery. And this, uh, this was the, uh, this overall survival was shown there that Sorry, um, it was a, it was a feasibility study of extrapolar pneumonectomy versus no extrapolar pneumonectomy, and there they have shown that it is showing not a survival benefit. But again, 
selection of patient becomes a issue. Regarding systemic therapy, cisplatin, primidrexate combination, cisplatin, primidrexate with ivazuzumab, primidrexate, gemcitamine, single acid primidrexate, gemcis, and immunotherapy, all these combinations are tried, but unfortunately not a very good outcome. But we all know that always we try to prefer doublet compared to single drug, and this phase three study published in JCO in 2003 showed that the prem cis done better than single agent. And this was the benchmark trial, which has standardized the treatment of uh, mesothelioma with doublet. And there was some discussion like non-small cell lung cancer, whether we can get some benefit by maintenance. This was a rotatum experience where they have shown the maintenance is getting a survival benefit, but it is not uh, I mean, a very strong recommendation yet in any guideline. Regarding single line chemotherapy, there are many effort given, but no strong clinical data. Addition of bivacuzumab, this is a big study. They have a phase three trial and they have seen a multicenter trial and they have seen that uh, addition of bivacuzumab is giving a p-value significant over OS benefit. But the question was that cost and toxic effect should be an issue during the selection. But this trial has established a role, just the name of the MAPS, the role of adding vivasuzumab in selected patient because it was giving a better benefit than the doublet. Regarding immunotherapy, no discussion is end without immunotherapy. So this was a trial checkmate 743 which has shown that the first line use of nibupo uh, and they have shown that um, it is giving better survival additional survival benefit compared to chemotherapy and on the basis of this trial even it was a first line trial fda has given approval this immunotherapy in mesothelioma in the second line setting not yet in the first line radiation therapy uh, it is mostly recommended for palliation, but postoperative radiotherapy in the chest can be given. This is a paper published from our Tata group, and they have shown that how they give the post surgery area the radiation, and they have shown that radiation group gets a survival benefit compared to non radiation group, even the series was smaller. Then the trimodality management this is the paper published from. Turkish friends, and they have taken a series of 20 patients in the protocol of all the three modality of surgery, radiotherapy, and chemotherapy. And they have shown that trimodality treatment is giving a good survival benefit. The median survival was 17.2 months, which is an encouraging result for um, pleural mesothelioma. And also they have shown that no node negative patients are doing better than node positive. So if you look at many series, of treatment, you will see that the trimodality group is always doing a better result, like Sugar Baker and Rush, Flores, Stewart, all you will see that trimodality is doing a good result. So, if we look at all the recommended guidelines of ISMO, ESCO, and British Society for pathological diagnosis, they have recommended not to rely on cytology alone. They have recommended the immunohistochemistry should be done, and they suggested that two positive and at least two negative for adenocarcinoma and two positive for mesothelial origin should be there to confirm the diagnosis. And they also mentioned that we need to identify whether the variety is epithelial, sarcomatoid, or biphasic because it is important for prognostic. In CCN and ESCO, recommended for chemotherapy that it should be offered either for medically inoperable patient or as a part of the multimodality regime. In symptomatic patients with epithelial histology and minimal pleural disease, who are not a surgical candidates, before starting chemotherapy, they have recommended we can keep the patient for observation also for certain period. For the first line, the preferred regime is premetrexate and cisplatin or premetrexate and carboplatin. Addition of vivasuzumab to premetrexate cisplatin in selected patient, but 
it should not be used bevacizumab in patient with cardiovascular comorbidity or uncontrolled hypertension or bleeding or clotting risk. Alternative first time chemotherapy may be primit gemcitamine cisplatin. And when patient is ineligible to platinum based combination, primit drexat or venerable single agent can be used. Second line and NCCN is recommended pembrolizumab and nivolumab alone or with epilimumab, venerolbin, gemcitamine, and pyrimixate if not administered in first line. ESCO, second line, they are recommending that if there is an interval of more than six months, we can rechallenge with pre exit and they have recommended to go for clinical trial or also they have recommended venoral beam. ESMO, they have recommended combination doublet, cisplatin with either pre exit or relitrexate and carboplatin to replace cisplatin when there is an ineligibility and ESMO recommended no second line standard of care. BTS first line, they have recommended again the same CISPREM with good performance status. Alternatively, they have recommended Reltrixet against Primetrixet. And PREM or Verinostat should be offered as second line treatment for patient with metastatic, malignant pleural mesothelioma. So regarding surgery, which will be covered by my next speaker, that NCCN and ESCO have given a specific guideline, which I'm not going to cover. For radiation therapy, NCCN is telling that the part of multimodality regime, radiation can be used or, but it should not be used alone as a modality. Prophylactic radiation is not totally recommended to prevent instrument tract recurrence after plural intervention as per NCCN guideline. Whereas ESCO is recommended against prophylactic RT, but recommended for adjuvant RT for resection of intervention tracts found to be histologically positive. So the BTS recommended against preoperative or postoperative RT prophylactic through the chest wall procedure tracts and hemithorax. So BTS is, so there is conflicting recommendation regarding radiotherapy. ESMO said RT to be given in an, in an adjuvant setting after surgery or chemo surgery to reduce the local failure rates no evidence for use as a standard treatment. When post RT is applied, they have mentioned to keep a very strict eye on the OAR issues. All four, four guidelines recommended radiotherapy for palliative therapy to relieve chest pain, bronchial residual obstruction, or symptomatic relief of metastasis in bone or brain. So here they were all aligned. And in 1929, the National Cancer Institute Thoracic Malignancy Steering Committee, International Association for the Study of Lung Cancer and Mesothelium Applied Research Foundation issued an expert opinion on the use of radiation therapy for the treatment of malignant uh, pleural mesothelium. The use of radiotherapy for MPM was recommended in the following scenarios, before or after extra pleural pneumonectomy, as an adjuvant to lung sparing procedure, that is without pneumonectomy, as palliative therapy for focal symptoms caused by disease. So this was the uh, recommendation of this consensus group. So I think with this, I can stop it here that I tried to cover uh, the brief overview and we will have some more discussion on the surgery and palliative therapy. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. F.M. Kamaluddin, uh, for his elaborative idea, elaborate idea regarding this uh, very critical topics. I would say. Uh, he, now I am now I would like to request our uh, second presenter of this day, Dr. Kaji Saiful Islam Shakil, who is the associate professor in NIDCH. And now over to Kaji Saiful Islam Shakil, sir, for his presentation. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, unfortunately, I am uh, in my hospital uh, uh, still now. I could not access my presentation from here uh, because of the network problem. So uh, I will uh, give a short discussion on the surgery for malignant pleural mesothelioma. Uh, I mean, unfortunately, without any subs uh, without any presentation or uh, PowerPoint uh, slides. So as uh, uh, Professor Kamal sir uh, already discussed, malignant pleural mesothelioma is a uh, 
quite ra uh, rare and uh, and very it's a very unfortunate disease for the people whom uh, who are affected so regarding surgery uh, uh, as we all uh, has some idea about the staging and the and the tnm uh, classification so regarding surgery uh, uh, the NC nccn guideline says actually there are uh, several guidelines uh, currently available the bts guideline the ers ests guideline the nccn guidelines i mean uh, there is no not a single uh, guideline that uh, that everybody is agreed upon uh, about what to do regarding the surgery. So regarding surgery, if we consider the surgical options in a malignant plural mesothelioma, first of all, uh, we can do, as uh, mentioned by Professor Kamaluddin, we can do extra uh, plural pneumonectomy or parietal pleurectomy and decortication. Now, these are the two major surgeries that are considered uh, in several uh, situations, but there are other surgeries like uh, palliative surgery. For example, we can do uh, plural biopsy, which is also uh, very important uh, regarding the establishment of diagnosis. So thoracoscopic plural biopsy is the gold standard here. And also in cases of plural effusion, we can evacuate the plural cavity by thoracoscopic uh, method and also do pleurodesis in selected cases. And uh, then the cytoreductive surgery or the debulking surgery, where we can, we can uh, only take out the visible uh, macroscopic nodules and lesions, uh, but which is not a R0 resection. In fact, according to NCCN guideline, there are no definitive R0 resectional surgery in uh, MPM, which means that uh in some areas there there must have been some residual tissues left after the surgery so if we consider the nccn guideline again they say that you have to uh, this is a tri modality or multi modality treatment approach so you have to involve the uh, pulmonologist the oncologist the thoracic surgeon the histopathologist and the radiologist all uh, in all in a group uh, to proceed with the, with, the, with the treatment. And then regarding surgery, we have to uh, do surgery on a selected patients who must be, who, who have a very good performance status and the disease stage must be very early, earlier stage of disease. And also in selective centers where there are, uh, there are the centers which are, deal, which are dealing with high number of cases uh, regarding uh, surgery for the <clears throat> malignant pleural mesothelioma. Now, if we consider extra pleural pneumonectomy, which means we take out the whole lung and the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura and the diaphragm and also and also the uh, uh, also pericardium. So this is an extensive surgery and with a very high mortality and morbidity. It says that in a uh, according to the BTS, uh, BTS guideline, the morbidity is uh, about 60% and the mortality, paraoperative mortality is four to 9%. So uh, if we consider the other surgery, the second one is the uh, PD or <clears throat> pleurectomy uh, decortication. Here we take out only the pleura, uh, only the parietal and visceral pleura, leaving uh, aside the lung, the pericardium and diaphragm. In this case, uh, the morbidity and mortality are uh, lesser, but uh, several studies shows that the overall survival and the outcome is almost the same between the between extrapural pneumonectomy and and parietal and pleurectomy decortication. So if if we consider this one, so uh, yeah, in my opinion, it is better to go for go for uh, PD uh, in selective cases, and because of the because of the differences of opinion. In defining the PD, what is pleurectomy and decortication in, in, in different guidelines? So the international uh, international uh, group for the for uh, international uh, group for interesting mesothelial uh, mesothelioma, the the IMIG, they came up came up with uh, three different categories of uh, parietal pleurectomy and decortication, which is 
Number one is only parietal pleurectomy. You take out only the parietal pleura, which is again a cytoreductive uh, surgery. And then number two, the parietal pleurectomy and decortication, leaving the lung, leaving the diaphragm and leaving the <coughs> pericardium. And then extended parietal, extended pleurectomy decortication, which is you leave only the lung, you take out the pleura, you take out the diaphragm and you take out the pericardium. So these are the various options of surgery, but you have to do these surgeries in early stages and also in, uh, in cases, uh, selective patients who have uh, good performance status and also in, uh, in selected centers who have high volume of surgery and experienced uh, surgeons are working there. And also another thing to be considered is the histology. If uh, NCCN uh, guidelines says if it is epithelioid origin or mixed origin, then the, then the outcome is good. But if it is, if it is sarcomoid or if it is stage four, then uh, we, they do not recommend surgery at all. So, and then uh, there are a uh, lack of uh, randomized control trial regarding the outcome of surgery or the com comparisons. But uh, some of the trials showed that, as I said earlier, that parietal, uh, that pleurectomy decortication has almost the similar outcome with uh, outcome with uh, compared to uh, extrapleural pneumonectomy. So most of the people considered PD to be uh, preferable because it it leaves it leaves the lung tissue there. It gives uh, it the the morbidity and the mortality is lesser than the uh, cases of EPP, and also. In further, in further recurrence, there, there are uh, some hope of uh, controlling the disease uh, in cases of recurrence. And one study by CQ Sao uh, in 2018, he showed that uh, the, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm talking about the uh, overall survival. He showed that overall, overall survival is, median survival is 9.1 to 9.4 to 27.5 uh, uh, months. And also in, in another uh, study by IASL, uh, International Association for Lung, Study of Lung Cancer, they showed 40, 40 months of overall survival. And CQ saw et al. also showed that one year, two year, five year survival is respectively 36 to 83%. Two year survival, five to 59 uh, months and uh, percent. And five year survival is zero to 24% only. So in any way, uh, surgery alone do not give any hope at all. So we have to go for tri-modality therapy. And uh, to concise the whole thing, we have to uh, consider the NCCN guideline again, that you do surgery for early stages. And if it's very early stage, like stage one, then NCCN says you go for uh, parietal pleurectomy, uh, pleurectomy decortication. If it's stage one to three with N0, N1, then you go for EPP in selective cases, <clears throat> sorry. And then if it is stage four, or if, if you go for palliative surgery, then you have, then you have pleurodesis to do, do with uh, video assisted thoracoscopic surgery, evacuation of fluid and, and pleurodesis with talc. And finally, there are two other methods uh, which, are, uh, which have been proposed recently. One is the intracavitary photodynamic therapy and also the hypothermic intraoperative leverage by povidone iodine or any other chemotherapeutic agents. But the randomized trials are uh, still to come. Uh, so that's all about surgery. So thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Kazi Sai Full Islam. Uh, so from your uh, speech, uh, we can consider that the uh, standard treatment for malignant mesothelioma should be the decortication or uh, pleurectomy rather than the extensive extrapleural pulmonectomy. So thank uh, you. I mean, it's it's not it's not uh, we do not have a consensus yet. Yes. But from from several studies, it seems that uh, overall survival and outcome morbidity mortality wise, I mean, if you go for uh, pleurectomy decortication. Uh, which is better in case of mortality, morbidity, but giving almost the same result uh, instead of EPP. Yes. Yeah, right. So thank you. Thank you for your nice, nice, uh, dis uh, nice, what I should say, nice uh, discussion regarding the extra, uh, regarding the malignant mes mes mesothelioma. Now we have, as you thank know, you. that we have a, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kazi Saiful Islam. 
Uh, we do have our foreign faculties, Dr. John Conivier. Now I would like to request Dr. John Conivier to say a few words regarding the recent management uh, of these topics. Dr. Tracy is already here. Sorry. Yes, sir. Uh, we, will, we will discuss uh, he, her part later, later the okay. discussion. Okay, fine. So uh, over to Dr. John Conivier. Uh, yeah, no, I thought both talks were excellent. As you said, you know, mesothelioma is uncommon. Certainly in the United Kingdom, it's a rare condition and we manage it in super regional centers because of its uncommonness and like most things in medicine, the less of it you see, often the um, less up to date you are in its management and um, the management of the toxicities of the drugs that you use to manage it. Um, we're very lucky in Barts where I work. We're a super regional mesothelioma center. Um, we take part in most mesothelioma trials. And in fact, from a surgical perspective, we're gifted with David Waller, who's the lead for the new um, the new meso surgical study, which finished recruitment just before Christmas. So, thank you for your talks today. Really interesting and very comprehensive. Thank you, thank you, Dr. John. Uh, now, as you know, that the main intention of treatment regarding the mesothelioma is the palliative intention, and now we have a special guest uh, from South Africa. Uh, she's Tracy Wood. She's the founder director of Glynis Gale Foundation, a UK based foundation who are mainly working in, in the supportive role in the mesothelioma victims. Now I would like to request Tracy Wood for sharing her experience with us. Over to you, uh, Tracy Wood. Thank you very much for um, inviting me to participate. I've got a, a presentation. Can I share my screen? Yes, please. Sorry, I just want to find which one it is. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Perfect, perfect. Um, so thank you for the introduction. I, um, as you say, I, um, I'm actually a UK based charity and I am, um, although my focus is um, in South Africa um, and um, how I really got into um, starting the charity was my mum was diagnosed with mesothelioma back in uh, 2018. Sadly, her disease progression was very, very um, uh, aggressive and she passed away in January of 2019. Um, she was blessed to be treated by uh, the team at Barts um, in London um, and um, actually under the care of um, uh, Dr. Waller and actually um, Dr. Conabir as well. He, he also saw her. So um, so when, um, when my mum was diagnosed, um, I had never heard about mesothelioma and actually um, I'm part of an international global campaign um, started by a lot of UK charities who um, uh, realized that, um, like Dr. Gonabia said, um, mesothelioma is actually a very rare disease. And so um, uh, when you talk to the general public and ask them what mesothelioma is, not many people will know. Um, and so uh, part of this international campaign is to raise awareness of mesothelioma. Um, so we were founded in um, 2019. Um, and our aims are really to improve the education of awareness uh, of mesothelia in, in, in South Africa, improvement of palliative care, and provide support to palliative care nurses um, through the provision of education, medical equipment, and participation in clinical trials. Um, so South Africa um, is an interesting case. The UK and South Africa are quite intrinsically linked in terms of their, um, their legacy of asbestos in that um, many of you know that South Africa is um, the southernmost country on the African continent. It's got 58 million people. Um, and um, according to the, the latest data from the World Health Organization, um, life expectancy in males is around 60.2 years and, and 67 in females. Um, 
South Africa was one of the top producing asbestos uh, countries in the world. And um, in fact, the uh, by the 1970s, they were exporting 373,000 tons of asbestos. Um, and um, they produce 97% of the world's uh, blue asbestos. And a lot of that asbestos is here in the UK. The mines themselves are actually found in the Northern Cape, which is a very, very rural area um, of uh, South Africa. It's, uh, it's one of the largest provinces. It's one of the poorest provinces. Um, and in terms of land mass, uh, it accounts for about 373,000 square kilometers. Um, there's still a lot of environmental impact um, uh, from asbestos and the mining legacy, although the mines were closed um, a long time ago. Um, they, they banned asbestos in 2008, but mining really stopped um, in the late 80s. Um, the environmental impact in some of the rural areas around the mines is significant. Um, what you can see on the screen is um, the uh, some of the asbestos, the raw form of asbestos that can be found in some of the mine dumps and in some of the rural schools that were built with asbestos bricks. Um, so you can actually see the asbestos fibers um, degrading. In terms of mesothelioma, um, the South, Afri South African figures show that MESA patients are some of the youngest um, out of 83 countries, um, although they do present late stage. So a lot of them present their symptoms at very late stage. Um, and compared to the UK comparison, um, the 2017 figures, there were 41 cases per million. However, in a South African context, um, there is a lot of misdiagnosis. About 50% of cases are misdiagnosed with either TB or HIV AIDS. Just some um, global figures in terms of uh, mesothelia, for instance, this is taken from Data Monitor Healthcare, but just to show you um, the progression that they're predicting from 2019 to 2028, um, they're predicting 30,000 cases worldwide, um, and by 2028, um, 33,900. You'll notice Europe um, alongside Asia are some of the highest figures. In terms of the split between male and female, um, you can see um, in, in, in the African context, it's, it's still predominantly male, although there is, um, there is a rise in the number of female cases that are occurring. Um, this is just a number of clinical trials worldwide. Um, unfortunately, South Africa doesn't um, have a lot of participation in clinical trials, and that's something that we want to uh, we want to change um, and we are uh, in the process of collaborating with um, a UK based professor to to potentially get some South African patients onto clinical trials. Um, and then in terms of the standard of care and drugs. Um, these are some of the top drugs, as, as uh, you'll be aware of. Um, in South Africa, uh, the standard of care is a uh, six cycle chemotherapy. In terms of palliative care in the rural setting, there are so, there are a number of challenges. Um, there are there are hospices around South Africa that provides uh, palliative care. However, um, because of the, the um, large distances and the makeup of the Northern Cape, palliative care services are quite sporadic. Although the uh, the local health care authorities are trying to bring organisations together, and that's really where we come into this. So we formed the palliative care, the Northern Cape Palliative Care Partnership, um, and part of that is to bring together um, organisations from the healthcare NGOs. Um, as the local asbestos trusts, charity workers to really provide a cohesive patient journey. So um, I'm going to look at the background of palliative care, where we are now, the national health system of South Africa, which accounts for um, around 80% of the patients, South African healthcare system, the public sector and challenges faced by patients in the Northern Cape. 
Um, so in 1980, palliative care star started in the non-governmental sector um, and hospices were established predominantly to treat HIV patients from the mid nineties onwards. Um, hospice services were led by nurses and supported by interdisciplinary teams. Um, hospice palliative care um, really looks after HIV, end of stage organ failure, neurological dis uh, disorders, tuberculosis, um, and in particular drug resistant TB, which is, is hugely prevalent um, in South Africa. Um, in terms of community-based uh, home care services, that really started um, in the so south coast of um, so, so the east coast of South Africa, where I'm from actually, um, and that was in response to the rising number of HIV uh, patients. Um, an integrated health care system led to partnerships with the government and leading to an increased awareness of palliative care. Um, and there are two um, centers of excellence. One is at the um, uh, Witt Palliative Care Center, and so that's uh, the Chris Baragwana, Chris Harney Baragwana Hospital, um, just outside uh, Johannesburg in Soweto, and Hrutuskir in Cape Town, which is also a large training hospital. Both of them are large training hospitals. Um, and a recent a recent study undertaken by um, one of the doctors that are participating in our partnership um, revealed that only 17.8 percent of patients. Um, benefit from palliative care at the end of their lives. Um, and if you, there's, there's 60 million people in South Africa, so 17.8% is a really low number. Um, the NGO sector is a traditional provider of palliative care, um, and they cannot, they can't meet the, the needs of the patients. Um, uh, in terms of government, um, government shouldn't expect that NGO should carry the burden, but currently they do. All healthcare professionals in South Africa have a role in identifying patients and families in need of palliative care um, and to initiate basic palliative care, connect them with community services and continue home-based palliative care. Um, in the context of um, the Northern Cape and particularly uh, the um, Kimberley Hospital, um, they're starting to bring together um, the, the stakeholders uh, within the palliative care community to, tr to provide a better um, experience to patients and their families. So where we are now, um, the uh, World Health Organization and member states called um, for strengthening palliative care as a component of a comprehensive health care system and integrating that into public um, health services. Um, there's a particular focus on primary health care, community and home-based care, and a fundamental to improve the quality of life, well-being, comfort, and patient dignity. In 2017, um, the South African National Policy Framework um, put together palliative care, uh, palliative care framework, um, and that was integrated into the National Health Care uh, Council. And the Minister of Health appointed a National Steering Committee for uh, palliative care. Um, and this looks to integrate palliative care into all levels of health care, um, although the barriers currently are resources, infrastructure, and capacity. Um, South Africa has uh, implemented a national health care uh, um, healthcare insurance, similar to the NHS, um, but they, um, I mean, it's still in its infancy, and so they've, um, uh, they are experiencing teething problems, as you would do. Um, but as part of this framework, um, the National Healthcare White Paper includes palliative care as an essential service. Um, and this should translate into palliative care being included into all healthcare facilities and being funded and funding being available for hospices. So one of the key um, findings that we experienced when we went out and visited a number of hospices, um, particularly those that had outlying centers, um, community-based mm -hmm. centers, was they didn't have they didn't have funding um, um, uh, it, it, to keep these centers open. And so um, a lot of those, those community-based daycare centers were closing. So one of the key things is to ensure that each province is um, specifically allowing for funding to have a partnership between the private hospices um, and government uh, organizations. 
one of the other parts, um, one of the other facets which we are um, supporting through um, the regional um, nursing school uh, in Kimberley um, is getting uh, palliative care into the syllabus. Um, they, a couple of years ago, they redid the nursing uh, syllabus. Um, and uh, so we waited for confirmation that they have included palliative care as a module for nurses. Um, if this hasn't been done, one of the things that we will be doing is working with um, the providers in uh, the Northern Cape to bring some palliative care, whether it's online training or um, funding training for nurses to go to the teaching hospitals um, to improve their palliative care skills. So South Africa's very really much got a tier two, uh, two tier system in terms of healthcare. Um, they, there's a public and a private healthcare system, and that's there are great disparities between what you receive in the public sector versus your private healthcare um, um, scenario. So um, the public sector that's funded by the government and available to all citizens at no cost. The majority of the population, 84%, approximately 40 million citizens, are uninsured and unable to, to access private health care. They utilize public health services um, and, and only 30% of doctors, and, and that, that care is provided by 30% of doctors. And we witnessed that uh, firsthand in the hospitals in um, Kimberley and Kuruman. So K Kimberley is obviously a big regional hospital, but when you go to Kuruman, where they've got the community-based hospitals, at some stages, um, there were no doctors there for six weeks. There were only nurses. And so, you know, that, that in itself um, is problematic for the patients. Um, so, you know, as a result, a lot of the, these uh, patients receive poor healthcare outcomes, um, poor managerial skills and negligence and poor resource allocation and service delivery. So as I said, um, the Northern Cape is the largest province in South Africa. Uh, Robert Magasilo Subuku Hospital is um, the main um, oncology hospital um, and the main referral center. Um, and it's the only hospital that has two oncologists to provide uh, the uh, oncology services. Um, there are two. There are limited um, oncology uh, services offered at the two district hospitals, which I mentioned: one in Kuruman and one in Uppington. Um, so Kuruman is around uh, two hundred and uh, ninety kilometers away from Kimberley, so patients have to travel significant distances um, to um, to go and see these oncologists. Um, so what they did a few years ago is, with the help of Bristol Myers Squibb, they um, introduced a nurse-led oncology clinic in um, in the regional hospitals. And how these nurse-based clinics work is that the patient goes to um, Kimberley for their scans, um, but they receive the, um, the oncology treatment in the regional hospitals um, by the nurses. So the nurse will get a prescription from the doctor for six months for everything that she needs, and she will treat the, um, the patients there at the, uh, at the local hospitals to reduce the amount of travel that they, they need to do. So some of the other challenges um, in terms of access to palliative care, there's some social cultural um, uh, challenges. There's around cultural beliefs um, at, in terms of how they manage the disease, uh, in terms of the, the family beliefs and how they manage that and access accessing palliative care. There's some stigmatization and misconceptions. So um, this very much comes out of um, um, where people are being treated with HIV AIDS. There's an assumption in some communities that if somebody accesses palliative care services or hospice, then they must be HIV positive. Um, poverty, um, like I said, um, the Northern Cape is the poorest um, of all provinces. Um, and in some, of the, um, in some of the communities, when we spoke to the, um, uh, the, the hospices, um, the community workers, um, crime, crime and safety and drug abuse was uh, prevalent. So, for example, some of the equipment was stolen. Some of the drugs that they, the patients had, were were were, were stolen and then sold on the black market. So that 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 is a challenge that the the communities have to deal with. 
healthcare system issues. Um, so there are the regional clinics, they, um, they experience communication issues, delays in diagnosis, um, and some of the nursing attitudes uh, were problematic, inadequate resourcing and transport and traveling long distances. Um, so one of the, um, the most heartbreaking scenarios that we encountered was these patients don't have, um, they're very rural um, um, and they don't have access to transportation to the clinics. Some of them are very, very ill. Um, and what we what we established was that they were being they weren't being transported by um, ambulance. What was actually happening was they were being put in the back of um, uh, of vans on mattresses and transported to the clinics and to the hospitals um, to get their care. So one of the one of the initiatives that we are looking to potentially do is to raise funds for an ambulance to transport these patients. Um, there is a need for adequate support systems for the family, um, the community and religious institutions. There's also a need for emotional counseling. You know, palliative care is not just looking at the patient and the, uh, the patient clinical needs, but it's also about the emotional needs and the spiritual needs of the patients. And so that's one of the areas that we, we, um, we are looking to bring together with all the stakeholders is to provide not just the better clinical outcomes um, and access to um, equipment and things that will make their day-to-day -day lives easier, but also to support them in a spiritual, um, in a spiritual way. Um, and then better physical symptom control. So here in the UK, um, if a patient, you know, from our mom scenario, if a patient uh, who has mesothelioma is struggling to breathe, um, they, um, they, they aren't given oxygen straight away. Um, there, there are things that in a palliative care setting, such as breathing exercises, breathing control, that, that type of um, um, symptom control, that, the, that's your first port of call. Um, and then um, really sort of at late stage, potentially oxygen is given. Um, in, in the South African scenario, um, things like oxygen are given, are, are given up front. The patient doesn't necessarily need oxygen. Um, and it, it does, it's, it's more of a comfort than a, than a, um, than a clinical need. Um, and so we are working with, um, I have the support of um, a, a clinical advisor from Mesothelioma UK, and she um, is working with some of the palliative care nurses to um, to introduce techniques, so breathing techniques, better symptom control, looking at um, um, how pain uh, is managed currently. So through you know whether or not it's morphine based pay, pain uh, prevention, uh, um, uh, pain management, or whether it's something uh, a different drug combination is something that we're also looking at. So specifically um, within Coromine, and, and we've um, we are working hard with with people on the ground to really address some of these um, these challenges. Is there is a lack of cancer and the sim the signs and symptoms um, of uh, of uh, what they should be looking at, and hence they present very late stage, um, which means there's very little clinical intervention that can happen. Um, there is definitely a need for palliative care advocacy, hence the palliative care partnership that we've formed. Um, there is need for a daycare center. And so we're looking at um, a piece of land that we can uh, put a, a day hospice on. We don't have the, the resources to do a full um, end of life hospice, but certainly giving some of the family some respite um, with a day center staffed by palliative care nurses. Um, Palliative care social workers, there are a lot of uh, community based workers in NGOs on the ground. Um, many of them are paid a stipend each month, which is not a lot of money, but they are very passionate about their patients. They don't have palliative care, they are really just the interface between uh, the nurses, the occupational therapists, and the oncologists. So, you know, to get them some training is important. Um, we are implementing a palliative care equipment library imminently we've uh, we found some space in Kuruman where we're able to provide things like walking rings, bedpan commodes, um, pressure sore prevention, those types of 
um, equipment that will improve the, the end of life care. As I mentioned, patient transport is an issue. Um, and uh, from Kuruman to the oncology facility at Kimberley. So that's something that we need to look at. Um, poverty is a big thing. And, and we've, you know, we experienced this um, firsthand with COVID. So um, these patients um, survive on very little money. Um, some of them, uh, it's around, some of them get a social grant, which is, um, around 1,260 rand, uh, which uh, from a pound equivalent is about 50 pounds a month um, that they have to live on. And that it covers their food, um, uh, any needs that they have for children, school fees, all of those types of things. Um, and so um, when it comes to nutritious food, that's, that's not something that's on their radar. And actually what we did um, during, at the start of COVID is we, um, we were giving um, basic food parcels to some of the, the patients uh, because they couldn't, you know, they, they couldn't access their grants. Um, they, um, you know, they were in lockdown, so the, the care was limited. So we wanted to make sure that at least they had some food uh, for the family. Um, and then funding of community workers, like I said, they currently re, uh, re, um, uh, receive a stipend, um, which is, is not a lot of money for them. Um, so I'll go through this very quickly. Um, this is just sort of our, our journey from when we started going out to South Africa in uh, 2019. We wanted to really understand treatment pathways, access to, man uh, to medicine, a speed of diagnosis in the home support, options for clinical trials or lack thereof, and then set out to really establish um, short, medium and long-term initiatives for the foundation to support. Um, uh, the image that you can see on screen, it'll yellow star is really where the um, where the sort of old mines were um, in uh, in South Africa. Um, and um, this is just some of the you know the, the images um, from from the the trip that we had the two hospitals two community hospitals um, a nursery a chemotherapy suite um, and like I said patients have to travel 200 plus kilometers to go and access services. Um, the image that you can see on the left-hand side are the two palliative care nurses, um, and um, they were with a patient. That patient is, uh, is 45, um, and um, the on the right-hand side, um, the um, the image that you can see at the bottom, that patient was 54. Um, so very, very young compared to some of the patients that that are in the UK. Um, and the the image in the middle is the um, uh, unrehabilitated asbestos tailing stump um, that's literally over the hill from one of the local vo villages and the schools. Um, and so part of our, you know, part of our initiative is to really look at grassroots um, and start off young because the, the next generation, because there is still asbestos in their communities, they will be affected by mesothelioma. And so education and awareness in some of these uh, communities, every single one of these children can tell you of a mother, father, uncle, cousin, um, somebody in the extended family that has died of mesothelioma. And actually they call it the dust. So it's, it's the common term is the dust and they know the dust is, is dangerous for them. Um, and then 2020 and beyond, um, so we did some palliative care training. We brought one of the nurses over to the UK um, last year and she spent some time at a local hospice. Um, and this is really in collaboration with Mesothelioma UK. Um, we are going to set up, like I said, a, a equipment uh, library um, that the community can access. We're looking to remediate a primary school. Um, we're in the final stages of negotiating with the government to um, to uh, sign the contract with us to uh, remediate the school um, that's currently con condemned. We're in talks with, um, uh, with one of the hospitals here to, um, to potentially have uh, the Robert Mshangwe Hospital in Kimberley participate in a, a clinical trial for um, mesothelioma patients. Um, we also in talks with uh, Sheffield University about uh, doing some research into palliative care and the perceptions of palliative care in South Africa. 
Um, and then ultimately, we'd like to find a day clinic or hospice to serve the patients in the surrounding areas um, to improve their access to palliative care. Thank you. Um, thank you for, for that. Um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tracy, for uh, sharing your experience and highlighting the most important component, uh, the palliative care in management of mesothelioma. Uh, definitely, we'll discuss in the later part uh, whether there is any possibility of applying this type of model here in Bangladesh or not. Uh, so till then, uh, please stay with us. Now uh, we have our another overseas expertise, Dr. Ullash Batra from joining. Hello, Ullash, uh, sir. Good morning. Good evening. Good afternoon on a Sunday afternoon. Oh. Okay, good afternoon, sir. Okay, and I, I would like to request you for giving the in 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 short regarding your clinical practice in mesothelioma. So, what your routine practice over there in uh, India in uh, in case of mesothelioma? So, uh, to start with, it's a very rare uh, disease. You know, I mean, uh, probably even in Rajiv Gandhi, we don't get to see more than one case or one to two cases per month. Uh, Basically, patients come to us with uh, uh, massive pleural effusion, uh, the diagnosis, and the typical thing is that you put an ICD tube, do a medical thoracoscopy, and then uh, send the, uh, you know, uh, send the tissue for uh, diagnosis. We do not usually get a very uh, significant asbestos history and all uh, from there. I mean, uh, I mean, most of the patients, in fact, I would say 50 to 60 percent of uh, the patients that have been diagnosed in the last one or two years. I've got no, uh, you know, history of uh, asbestos or cement exposure or something, but still they get. Uh, typically, I would say uh, because the diagnosis takes time and all, uh, uh, we do treat them with new adjuvant chemotherapy, three cycles with pemetrexate, cisplatin, uh, because patients are not very keen to undergo such an extensive surgery to start with. It also gives us uh, time for the surgeon to access, uh, to you know, assess the patient, get for the uh, get for, uh, you know, the fitness for surgery and everything. After three cycles, we do give, uh, we do, uh, because you're a very aggressive thoracic surgeon with us. I mean, surgeons are usually aggressive, you know, you don't have to say aggressive thoracic surgeon. Uh, you say surgery, they're aggressive. Uh, the patients do undergo uh, EPP, that is uh, uh, the surgery, and we finish off with chemotherapy, but the disease does come back. Uh, it does come back. I mean, you know, uh, there is, and uh, very often we are, uh, I mean, you know, uh, we, are, we are very confused in the tumor board whether uh, the resection is R0, R1. Uh, radiotherapy typically doesn't have a role. Sometimes it is, uh, the, the tumor is stuck to the pericardium. Uh, they shave it off, but the margins are closed. The cases are discussed in tumor board in detail, uh, but the radiation oncologists do not give uh, uh, radiotherapy uh, typically in this uh, thing. Uh, the disease does come back uh, in 40% uh, of cases, I would say. But again, these are small numbers, and I haven't really analyzed my data. Uh, so immunotherapy also, Dr. Kamal asked me to say it initially later on. I haven't really. Uh, there are two patients in which I did try to do. I, we did try to add bevacizumab uh, in a couple of patients, in an upfront metastatic patient. And we also gave immunotherapy in one of the patients, but not really uh, very hopeful. Although there are certain variants, the low-grade variants of uh, mesothelioma, uh, which have gone on and which we have given maintenance for metrixid also, an occasional patient, and that's a recall bias, who have gone for three, four years also. Uh, but honestly, I haven't really analyzed my data on that. Small numbers. So that's so, my take. So uh, regarding the maintenance, you are not uh, in favor of this maintenance, right? So the, there was a trial which had compared Pemetrix and maintenance. There was no there was no benefit of that. So most of the time, uh, you can expect that it will it will back. So in second line, what should be your uh, preferred option? So what I usually do is that I look at, let's say you have given six cycles of PEMCA. When, the, when does the disease come back and what is the volume of the disease? So let's say it comes back after six months to one year. You can re-challenge with Pemetrix and Carblatin. Otherwise, uh, the gemcitabine, nevilbine, uh, these are two drugs which give. The performance status really becomes bad uh, at that time and, you know, uh, small number. So, it again, depends on less than six months, more than six months. If it comes in more than six months, I reach them with PEMCARB. If it doesn't, then I probably give them gemcitabine, nevilbine, and depending on the patient's performance status. 
thank you sir uh, let us uh, discuss with uh, dr john conivier dr john are you there i think radiation oncology doesn't really have a rhodos or a seguan to take cell you know <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe that's why he, he is not there uh, so okay uh, so now i would like to take some question from the chat box uh so one question is there already you have discussed is there any role of uh, immunotherapy in uh, mesothelium or not uh, so, so trials are uh, undergoing right now but honestly uh, there is no biomarker the drug is not yet approved in india for the same so not a big fan of that it's it's not the same as lung cancer there is a study uh, we call it 743 uh, they have tried dp and nevo and they have got a good result particularly for the yeah. non epithelial group so what your uh, yeah, the point is it? yes again uh, if it, it's, it's not really reimbursed in the country it's not approved in our country uh, epilimumab and nevo is only approved for uh, rcc in our country and that also just two months back uh, very expensive uh, so honestly i i, I haven't tried really so last i have a question regarding the diagnosis we can see that it is a big challenge to diagnose mesothelioma because always they are telling that uh, only uh, histology is not uh, histopathology is not enough you need to take a support of positive and negative immune history how do you struggle at your center oh yes it, the report only comes out of 5 days sir i mean a normal lung cancer report will come in 2 days time you do a, a ck you do a ttf1 but in mesothelioma ckdd1 both are negative so we do use and then they also because you know as i said uh, sometimes the history of asbestos exposure and uh, uh, cement exposure is not there really much then they keep on doing other markers like burp for and all but then you know we do use wt1 and calratinin which will then clinch the diagnosis uh, so pathologists also want to uh, you know kind of save of their tissue uh, so typically a diagnosis of mesothelioma will take around 5 to 6 days in our setup with a typical lung cancer diagnosis will take probably around not more than 2 to 3 days so shuman i want to emphasize to our colleagues here that in bangladesh if we see a patient diagnosed as a mesothelioma we should go back to our pathologist that did you uh, study this ihc to reconfirm it because you know sometimes uh, i mean it is written in the guideline in the books that it is very difficult to differentiate between adenocarcinoma and mesothelioma or mesothelial reactive cell with mesothelioma and so if it is wrong sir, diagnosis maybe we are landing in a wrong especially sir there are two more things that i would like to say a new diagnosis of carcinosarcoma has come uh, with metexon 14 splicing mutation that can be confused sometimes with this uh, and definitely i mean we need to do a good ihc marker there, there is no there is no two uh, thoughts about it okay really that is that is really challenge that and particularly there is another problem that is the from the thymoma that might be uh, metastasis to to yeah. the pleural surface that that is really challenging scenario because the uh, so immune one good thing that we one good thing that we always do is we discuss these cases in our mdd tumor board uh, so you know i mean there is where i mean um, honestly if you don't have a mdd right now start an mdd uh, that's the best way to you know share responsibilities and the radiologists the pathologists the medical surgical decision makers come the ir people come and it it really becomes the decision making becomes very very easy because when you see the scans in front of your eyes you listen to other people's opinion the palliative care experts come in uh, it's it's a fantastic way to go about so i have a particular question to tracy uh, though uh, uh, she has shown regarding the uh, mesothelium aspect of palliative care management but mesothelium here in bangladesh is not very large numbers so uh, can you share how we could apply this type of models here in bangladesh for palliative care setup so what's your suggestion regarding this so i think um i, I don't think it it matters how many patients um you know even if the numbers are low i think the the important part is to ensure that there's a patient pathway um so one of the things that um we are wanting to establish um um and it's it's based on the uk model so um it, is that patient pathway pathway and the patient pathway really starts from diagnosis um and then it takes them all the way through to the end of life care and ensuring that all of their healthcare providers are on that journey with them um means that the patient outcomes will um be better and so that that really that model um 
has been rolled out. So it's almost like this wheel and spoke model, right? So it doesn't matter about the distance. It's very much there's a hub of of um, of care providers that it, that um, work with the families and work with the community workers to ensure that um, the patient care and the patient outcomes uh, are, are everyone's aligned. Um, so, so that would be that would be my uh, my suggestion, is some kind of a patient pathway. Okay, thank you. Uh, you have a question or comment, please. Yes, yes. Uh, you, you you can you can ask the question directly. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Shumon and Kamal. Uh, actually, the question uh, what Shumon asked to Tracy was very important for in aspect of Bangladesh, uh, South Africa, Kimberley and Kurumane, where Tracy uh, is supporting. Uh, our patients there, uh, uh, we have to note the basic thing, like in South Africa, Lesotho, the oncology patients are highly subsidized by the government uh, in terms of uh, like uh, uh, chemotherapy, radiation, uh, and like government pays for everything in uh, South Africa and Lesotho for their citizens, uh, which uh, I don't know, like if we compare with Bangladesh, uh, I don't know how is the situation now are they buying the drugs or uh, chemotherapy or like shortage of chemotherapy or targeted therapy or anything that they have to buy or how much is the supply you have to consider. And also for palliative care, uh, the support system like pain management medication is uh, also supported by the government of South African government of Lesotho for their citizens. I don't know. Can you please anyone of the radiation oncologist or chemotherapy or even the, uh, yourself, Shumon, if you can overview us then it will be easier for Tracy and us this side in Africa to, uh, to give the model a, 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 like a suggestion, like how we can do it in Bangladesh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mubashar Bhai, for your nice idea. Definitely I will share uh, with our colleagues and I will get back to you. Kamal Bhai, do, uh, do you have any suggestions? So Mubashar, in quickly, I mean, uh, we have the both government and private as like the South Africa. But government is supporting, but not as great as South Africa because our patient burden is quite high. So they have a limited resources. So at one time it is exhausted. So we are not ensuring the 100% supply of chemotherapy. Radiation is subsidized. There is a long queue. So I think to deal with this, we can give you the provide the information and by writing, you can, and Prissy can send us a proposal which we can work out later on. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be very happy to do that. Very happy to do that. Okay, Shuman. Thank you. Uh, la last, we have we have few minutes left, uh, so now I would like to request uh, our guest, Dr. John Conivier, to uh, say a few words regarding the radiation therapy aspects in mesothelioma. Dr. John. Yeah. So, in my sort of uh, clinical sort of observation, I'd say it always seems the response rates of meso to radiotherapy always feels a bit like non-small cell lung cancer, to be honest. And um, even sort of palliative doses, 20 and 5, 30 and 10, can actually result in some quite dramatic responses in regards to uh, tumor volume shrinkage. Um, I think as, as mentioned already, you know, uh, historic clinical practice was to offer post-operative radiotherapy to port sites. We no longer we no longer do that since the clinical trials showed there was no benefit in terms of local recurrence. Um, with respect to post-operative radiotherapy, so um, we've taken part in the MARS-2 trial in BARTS, and now there's talk about where we go next in regards to uh, uh, surgery and radiotherapy. I think the historic challenge has always been being able to deliver a, an adjuvant dose of radiotherapy to the, to the hemithorax safely. And I think, as was mentioned earlier, obeying the constraints of the organs at risk is obviously critical so as to, um, so as to avoid the pitfalls of toxicity and morbidity from that radiotherapy. I think things have moved along. So with the advent of advanced delivery techniques such as VMAT, IMRT, we've got one step closer, but it's still actually very difficult, I think, to meet your constraints. You know, the future, perhaps, this may be a role for things like proton therapies, which again is that kind of 
one percent of the world population probably has access to so it's not really within the grasp of um, the majority of the patients who we've talked about today but um, perhaps something in future a solution for meeting those OARs while delivering your dose effectively for local control so something for the future to watch out for perhaps thank you so thank you. Uh, thank you all our overseas guests for their nice inputs. Now we are at the end of our program. Uh, I would like to express my gratitude to our academic partner AstraZeneca and MGAs for their academic collaboration. Uh, so from, <clears throat> from my point of view, uh, this is the end. Now I would like to request our chairperson, Professor Amy Heiser to conclude the session. Paul, Shuman, Paul. Union take Paul. Post up. Uh, Sorry? Post test. Post -test. Post -test. Okay, I forget to. Uh, yes, is the poll. So, Shamir, can you please show the poll again to see whether there is any improvement in the uh, response? Already done, sir. Okay. So, may I request all the participants? So as already Dr. Kamal Bhai and uh, uh, Ullash Patrasar has uh, said that the core biopsy along with immunostochemistry would be the right modalities of treatment as you can uh, find it very difficult to distinguish between uh, mesothelioma and some metastatic lesions in the uh, plural. So always we need to do the immunostochemistry for a <clears throat> definite diagnosis. Uh, I'll just I'll just want to say a, a couple of words uh, at this moment uh, before the end. Uh, actually, we uh, I have seen my very, one of my very close friends from my medical school, Dr. Hassan Zaman, who expired uh, last week. Uh, he was suffering from mesothelioma for almost uh, two and a half years, and he had done EPP and also uh, went to chemo graduation, but unfortunately he. Uh, passed away last week. So I, uh, that's a very personal one for me. He was a pediatric surgeon as, as a, working as an associate professor in Midford Hospital. So I seek uh, prayers for him from all, all of you. Thank you. Thank you uh, for sharing this information. Uh, now the question, the decortication or extrapural pulmonectomy already we have uh, informed the, from our uh, learned speakers that decortication or extrapolar pneumonectomy are going to produce the equal outcome, but there are different types of morbidities. Uh, so uh, in mesothelioma, you never forget to give chemotherapy because chemotherapy uh, probably the backbone of the treatment and hemotherapy, hemo, uh, hemothoracic IMRT can be an option. Triple modulus treatment can be sometimes good for uh, some subset of patient with good performance status. So now the third question. So we are happy to see the shift of opinion from first to second. But we are, today I'm very happy to con connect John and Tracy. It is a, such a coincidence that Tracy's mother was treated by John and we didn't knew that we are inviting both of them in the same session. <laughs> <laughs> what a coincidence. Well, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> small world. Small Very world. small world, absolutely. <laughs> uh, so, uh, regarding the emphasis trial, uh, which proves that the cisplatin prematrix is better than uh, cisplatin alone, and it has produced 3.6 months overall survival benefit. And MAPS trial, cisplatin prematrix, bevacizumab combination produce some better outcome, but uh, Considering the bevacizumab, map, you, we should consider about the financial toxicity also. Nivoipulimab, uh, there is also a trial that we have already discussed, but yet it is not in the guidelines. And gem carbo, uh, probably it is the second line options. Uh, so from Bangladeshi perspective, cisplatin premetrix is the drug of choice. So that's all from me. Uh, now I would like to request our professor, uh, President Professor Amy Heiser to conclude this session. Thank you so much. It was a very nice afternoon. We had lost, learned lots about lots about 
Kırmızı tırı emanası böyle değer dizir. Dünyada var. Foreign delegate from, foreign country faculty from South Africa, Tracy Wood. She has given us a, a description of this creative PR being going on in South Africa. He's organizing this. We could have asked her to give us some time. Also, thanks to John and Lass as usual, all the participants. And thank you, Asha Paul. He has joined us. Their partnership. Thank you all. I think it's our time. So, let's say it now for Allah. Bye bye. So, can you show the full result? Yes, uh, no, Doctor, uh, today's winner. So as you know, that every day we used to pick one lucky winner from our participants. So today's winner, Dr. Abdullah Al Mamun. Dr. Abdullah Al Mamun is today's winner. Is he still there? Can I see his face? Mamun, can you please uh, oh, open yeah, your video? Oh, yeah, it is. Thank, thank you, sir. Congratulations. Uh, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Congratulations, everybody. Uh, so uh, with this, uh, I would like to request you all to participate in our next program that is that will be on the next day, next time, and it will be on bronchial carcinoids. So till then, uh, goodbye from my end. Next.